yeah we can get started okay so last class we were talking very briefly about what physics happens in the atmosphere of the sun and why we want to observe so what i want to tell you today about is what quantities we aim to observe sort of directly of course we can't really measure them directly and that's what i'm going to try to, to convince you even if we just talk about the intensity of the light which is going to be the key quantity that we're interested in we can't measure that one directly the only thing that we can measure basically and that's going to be our conclusion today are the counts on some sort of data and we need to go backward and transform it into the quantity that we want to know and then we can compare it with the theory and try to and hope to learn something about the, uh, about the sun so what i want to talk about today are some basic Usually in the books, they're called photometric quantities, but we can also call them spectrophotometric quantities or whatever we want. We'll try to define them to see which units these are in, etc., etc. And we're going to talk about a little bit about how the telescopes work. So I'm going to basically remind you of the things that you probably did in your optics class during your undergrad. Some of the people maybe didn't do such a thing, so maybe some of the things here will be new to them. So that's why the things are going to be super, super basic but i'm going to provide some links which go into this optics of the telescopes further and i can also ask some people around to actually recommend you some books if you're really into this actually amanda maybe already knows know some things that and, and you can ask her and she will be probably happy to to recommend that so let's recap really quickly so what we what we spoke about last time so we said that the only thing that we see we see the atmosphere of the sun we don't see the interior of the sun and then i told you I presented you a few physical phenomena that in order to probe the physics of that phenomena you need to do basically observations and more specifically you need to do multivalent observations so we spoke about granulation and how we can measure the velocity of granulation we spoke about the sunspots and prominences and how we can map their magnetic fields we spoke about the corona and how we can observe corona and how the problem is that it's you know very very thin so the the brightness is very low so you need to obscure the disk and then also another problem that we will talk about further when steve tells you about it is that when you look at the corona you see all the way through so you see the integrated light over huge distances so it's not very easy to say where that light comes from and so on and so on and i was take i was stressing very very often and that was perhaps annoying but i'm going to stress it many more times is that it's very important to have observations done at multiple wavelengths. And uh, here in the US, we are maybe more used to things like space missions and maybe filter graph observations, like for example, provided by SDO. And there is a vast amount of science being done with SDO, right? And the thing that SDO provides you is AIA, right? Provides you, I don't know how many, but 10 ish different filters in UV, and then you can look at the sun and infer many interesting things from there. But what we get from some other missions, and namely what we usually get from the ground based telescopes, are these 3D data cubes, where we actually get the continuous formation, uh, continuous wavelength information over a very short span of the wavelengths. And then I told you that, for example, the steps in the wavelength can be as low as tens of milli angstroms right that's really small wavelengths there and last time uh, actually there is a very nice slide here from uh, from our colleague francisco iglesias who is actually going to be visiting us in a couple of weeks here then so and this illustrates uh, the thing that we talked about at the end of the last class the, the problems how to map a three-dimensional data cube so here in the top you see the example of a three-dimensional data cube which is a small core so here you can see the image of the pore in X and Y, but then we also want to have the wavelength information, like how does this pore look at different wavelengths? And then the problem was that we couldn't really, right, our, our detectors are 2D, so we can't simultaneously make an image of this thing. And then that naturally leads to the to few different kinds of the, of the detectors, and one way how to dissect the data is to slice it in some way. And one, one way is to do the so-called filter graphs, where you literally have the image of, the, of this object at all these wavelengths. So you have somehow a very, very narrow wavelength filter, and you move it between the red and blue wavelengths. Red and blue is, is 
of course, misleading here because we are talking of these really, really, really tiny steps. Okay, we're going to see an example of specifically this kind later. However, what you can also do is you can slice the image according to, to spatial directions, and then you're basically going to get these so called slit spectra, and then you can assemble it in a cube. In the end, I'm going to literally show you these things on an on a example of the data set. And then there are more advanced methods here that we are not going to delve into now, but it's important to, to know that there are, for example, these integral field solutions, and one of these is actually DL nurse that is going to be an instrument that DKIST, and that can look at this, and, and that's why it's sliced here like this. We can only look at very small fields of view this way, but we can get simultaneously spatial and wavelength information. And then again, previously we had uh, we had image of uh, done in uh, calcium eighty five forty two line that uh, done at IBIS. In the meantime, Kevin gave me even nicer one. And I actually think you can find this in the hallways of NSO. So if you wonder the hallways of NSO, there are four images of a solar surface done at four uh, different wavelengths, and you can see these differences here. So I'll just let this video here loop, and I want to stress once again, also because some people were not here last time, the importance of, of having the multivalent observations. And for example, now you see the granulation that we talked about, but as you are going toward the center of the line here, you see some completely different physics. The image looks completely different. And one of our intuitive things was to say, okay, the Intensity in the image is somehow related with the temperature. So brighter chunks in the image are going to correspond to regions with higher temperature. The, the, the darker ones are going to correspond to lower temperatures. However, once you get to the wavelengths, which correspond to the line core, it's much more complicated than that. Actually, Momo is an expert on this topic. I think he already published the paper, right? So he can at some point tell us more. But there is as you are getting to these, to the cores of the very strong lines, more and more interesting things are happening. Velocities come into play, absorption come into, comes into play, radiative transfer comes into play, and so on and so on. Uh, main premise that I always want to stress here, the main reason for this dependency of the, of the way solar surface looks on the valent is because there is a very dramatic variations in opacity over the wavelengths here. And it's sort of intuitive uh, for, for all of us, I think, that more opaque the medium is, we see more shallow regions, right? So core of the spectral line is very, very opaque. So we see very high regions. When we go to, to the wings and to the continuum wavelengths, opacity is much lower, so we see the deeper regions. In the second part of the course, I'm really going to formalize this. We're going to solve radiative transfer equation. We're going to get to some uh, you know, uh, how do you say, rules of thumb regarding these things. So we will be able to relate really the intensity that we see to some sort of heights or depths or however you, okay? But this looks pretty cool, right? And once again, these sort of images are, are focusing on very small regions in the sun. And also what we're gonna talk today, we're gonna talk about different designs of the telescopes, which allow us to see different, different amounts of the, of the solar surface. Okay, so last time I told you to think about this image here. Actually, this is the data set that we're going to look today at the end of the class if we can type. This is one of the most famous quiet sun maps. It's so-called Bruce Lights map, because Bruce Lights was one of the uh, PIs for the, for the Gnode space, for the Gnode spectral polarimeter, and this is the map which maps the quiet sun in, in great detail. And I told you it has like 2 million pixels. Right. And this is the intensity in the continuum. And, what, and the only thing that you basically see here are the granules. So now, considering the physics that you already know, what, what could you infer from this? I told you to think a bit about this. What could you infer from this image alone? There's convection. There's convection, sure. OK. But can we extract some quantitative results? Thought density, some sort of qualitative estimate of density, just because there was more stuff there, there was more photon flux. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that could help. But the thing is here, 
I want you to try and relate this to some fundamental law of nature. Fundamental law of nature, Fundament, some, some physical model. So we have an image, right? What can I, what can I try to use? People, people who are following online, you can also chime in with the ideas. It's complicated, but let's just say I give you intensity of something. I give you number of photons. What does number of photons have to relate to? Temperature. Temperature, exactly, exactly. So what you could do is you could say, okay, my intensity at given wavelength follows from the simplest possible law that describes the intensity, that is black body radiation. So this is black body radiation law uh, written in terms of wavelength. So basically, the thing that we need to know now is we need to know, we would have to know the intensity of each of these pixels in absolute terms, which means in SI units or CGS if you prefer. And then since we know the wavelength, right? Wavelength is roughly uh, 630 nanometers. So we just can use this equation to infer temperature everywhere in the image. Of course, this is the super basic thing. And, and if you did this, you couldn't really publish a paper with that because people would be like, hey, hey, there are more sophisticated ways of doing this. But it's important for us to think about, to already start thinking about connecting physical models to, to the observed data. One problem here is that uh, we don't know this specific intensity in the image because we don't know what we get, uh, and we are going to talk about it much more today, what we ultimately get and what you would get if you went to you know, the downloaded the data and uh, had a look at it, you would get some sort of count, some sort of arbitrary numbers. You wouldn't get the absolute values of this in whichever units it is. We're going to talk about it very soon. But what you could do, for example, and I'm going to give it to you for the homework, is that you could say, well, on average, this image should emit like the quiet sun. I know that quiet sun surface temperature is roughly 5,800 Kelvin, right? So I can relate the mean intensity in whichever units to the appropriate intensity of the quiet sun corresponding to 5,800 Kelvin. And then I can use it to sort of scale each of the individual pixels here. So very often we have to think about calibrations like this. We need to, we need to think how to relay the things that we are measuring to the, to the absolute units somehow in order to be able to do quantitative predictions, okay? So this is, this is just showing you what the things are gonna be about. Don't, don't dwell on this too much. I'm just gonna show you some hints of things that we are gonna be doing later. So what, are, what is the main problem of this approach? Can somebody tell me like, why is this approximation bad? regions of different temperature across the whole Well, you do, but if I say one pixel has, hey, but if I say one pixel has one temperature, okay, then I can relate the intensity of that pixel at given wavelength to its temperature, right? So if I, if I knew these things, I could give you the, ah, okay, I see your point. You meant regions in which sense? Uh, like, say you have an active region and a sunspot, Quiet sun over here. Okay, okay. Uh, no, I mean, in, in, in that sense, I can say, okay, the sunspot is darker. It has smaller intensity. I'm going to get smaller temperature. Nothing wrong with that. But why is this expression bad, even if I'm going to look at the individual pixels? The sun is not in LTE. The sun is not in LTE. Yeah, actually, this is not even so-called LTE. This is TE. So black body is a very restrictive approximation, right? Black body is technically a body that we heat to some temperature. And uh, in order for stars to really behave as black bodies, they would have to have completely uniform temperatures, right? And strictly speaking, black body uh, emits everything that it absorbs. And sun doesn't really absorb much radiation, right? There is nothing heating the sun from the outside. So sun is actually emitting the radiation. So it's sort of, it's definitely not in thermal equilibrium, right? And, and actually, the, the main thing that I'm aiming here is that the temperature has certain gradient as we, as we go 
from the top to the bottom. And when we look at the structure of the atmosphere, and we'll meddle with that a lot in the second part of the course, is we see the temperature is not constant. It varies from roughly six and a half thousand in the photosphere, it falls down to almost 4,000 Kelvin, and then it starts rising, and eventually it's gonna reach millions of Kelvin in the corona. And so it varies in depth, and it also varies, as the picture here suggests, it also varies with X and Y. And to show you this, to, to illustrate you this thing is, I'm just gonna uh, show you how this picture looks like a different wavelength. So keep in mind that, that I told you roughly what Kinoga does. It somehow makes images of sun at different wavelengths, very close ones. So already when I move by few tens of, of milli angstroms, my image of the sun looks completely different. And now again, I can find these intensities, right? I, I could again relate them to some temperatures, but now these would be some completely different numbers, right? And not only that these would be some completely different numbers, their distribution in X and Y would be completely different. Okay. And usually what we want to say is that different wavelengths, even when they are so nearby, correspond to different heights. And in principle, you could say, okay, well, all the bad approximations aside, I'm gonna use this black body approximation on the previous image, I'm gonna get some temperature distribution, then I'm gonna use it on this image here, I'm gonna get some other temperature distribution, and then I can say, well, the previous image is, you know, at the photosphere, this one is, let's say, 200 kilometers above the photosphere. And there's a lot of theory and modeling and you know, arguments that sort of allow us to make these conclusions to say, okay, this is 200 kilometers above this and so on, this wavelength broke these regions, et cetera, et cetera. So this was just to show you that, or okay, not really to show you, more to tell you that you know, different wavelengths broke different depths and we could do, you already now, even without knowing anything about spectroscopy and radiative transfer, we could do some very, very basic, basic diagnostics. Okay, does it make sense? But what I'm gonna teach you over the course, what are we gonna teach you over the course is much more sophisticated methods than this. All right, let's move on then. Let's delve a little bit into what this intensity means. Okay, so I have written you this uh, this equation first. How many people in this room, at least, and then I'm going to extrapolate to people online, have seen this equation here before? Has everybody seen it? No. Okay. Well, this is uh, let's let let's then uh, let's then see what this intensity means, basically. So intensity is a quantity that basically describes. I'm gonna say this in words, I'm gonna say this in words many times, and then we're gonna dissect this equation here. It tells you how much energy passes through some point per unit surface, in unit time, in unit solid angle, per unit wavelength. Okay, intensity is a very tricky physical quantity. And one of the reasons why it's so tricky is because the photons, contrary to all the other particles, can go through each other. And we talked about in the, we mentioned accidentally in the previous lecture that the number of photons is not conserved, which is, and that's because they don't have the mass. Okay, so intensity is a quantity that basically tells you everything about the spatial, angular, angular, temporal, and wavelength distribution of your photons. Okay, so for example, if we were to talk about density, and we want to talk about the density of the air in this room. In each point, we can say, okay, density is such and such, and it changes with the position and it changes with time. So it's in a way four dimensional quantity, okay? However, right, let's imagine that I have a laser going through this point here, going, going through the room, going from the center of the slide up there to that clock that says Colorado. Uh, the thing is that if I focus on one point, on, on this beam, I can define this quantity here, the, the intensity, and I call it 
specific monochromatic intensity. I'm going to tell you now what specific and monochromatic means. I can define it in this point, right? And, but there is also different intensity in this direction, different in this direction, different in this direction, different in this direction, right? And actually I have infinite directions because I can define it through the angles. And then again, I have different intensity at each of the wavelengths. So we have position, three coordinates, time, four coordinate, direction, it's two angles, right? Six and the wavelength. So intensity is seventh dimensional, is, is the quantity that we need to describe using seven variables, right? And that's one of the main reasons why, if when you get in the modeling side of the things, uh, MHD simulations, uh, and body simulations, and so on and so on, are much more advanced than simulations involving ra radiation because radiation is so much more numerically demanding. And we always have to approximate these things using some, some ad hoc solutions. I'm not going to go too much in this. I'm, I'm just going to tell you basically what I'm now going to go again to this picture here on the, on the bottom left, which is sort of very, you will find it in a lot of books. Okay, so let's say that this is this point here where the coordinate system starts is a point at the surface of the sun. Okay, and we make a very small surface, D sigma, around it. And then, we've, and then obviously from this surface, the, the light is going to be emitted in all directions. And at, strictly speaking, at all the wavelengths. Does it make sense? Yeah. The thing is that there won't be equal amounts of light at each, at each wavelength, and there won't be equal amount of lights emitted, uh, light emitted, or if you prefer photons, emitted in each direction. And then what we define is this quantity, specific, specific meaning per unit surface, and hence I'm dividing here with d sigma, okay? monochromatic, which means at specific wavelength, and so I'm dividing here with d lambda, right? Uh, and then I'm dividing with, uh, and then intensity, and intensity somehow implies directionality of the quantity, so that's why we are looking per unit solid angle, and then we have per unit time. Okay, so I can also, trans I could also transform this energy here as number of photons times energy of one photon, right? And in that way, the intensity would be proportional to the number of photons passing through this cone here, okay, divided by the unit surface, divided by unit time, divided by the solid angle of this cone, and divided by the wavelength band, basically, I'm looking. I'm going to try and, you know, give you a few examples of how this is this is done, but what's important for us to here to, to understand is the difference between these two equations. This is the definition of the intensity. This is how you would measure it. We, we now basically made the dot experiment, right? We count the number of photons passing through this cone here, we divide with these quantities here, voila, we get the intensity. This here is expression for the intensity of the radiation of a black body, right? If I have a black body of given temperature and I'm focusing at this wavelength lambda, this is what intensity is going to look like, right? So this is basically the, the definition of an observable. This is the solution of one physical problem. We will see later, later, later is not later, later is in March. We will see that real solutions that we use for proper diagnostics are much more complicated. Than this. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so this is definition, and this is the actually the intensity corresponding to, to this specific approximation. And what we actually would like to know when we do our measurements is we would like to know the intensity here. Okay. Cool. And the unit, yeah, let's talk about units. I always like to talk uh, to talk about units, and I, I hope this is not boring, but it's it's good to think about what what this will look like. So obviously we have energy in joule, we have surface in meter squared, uh, joule over second. So this division here is gonna be the power. Steradian is gonna be for the solid angle and um, I, in principle this should be meter, right? I just put angstrom in order not to confuse you because if I put meter squared and meter, you would ask yourself why didn't this guy just put meter to the three. But then if I put the angstrom, then it emphasizes the fact that this 
that the meaning is completely different, that this is the, uh, the surface and that this is the valence here. Okay, so, uh, so think about it always like whenever you're solving the problems, as I said, we'll try to make the problems practical, but still try to see if the units fit, if the things make sense. Okay, cool. So let's try now, some of the people are familiar with this, let's try to do a five minute exercise. So if you don't have pen and paper, borrow, borrow it from somebody else. So let's say that we have a pixel of quadratic shape of size 100 kilometers times 100 kilometers. So that pixel basically represents the surface on the, on the sun. And then we have a radiation at this wavelength here, 630 nanometers. And then we have, and then the intensity at that wavelength leaving this surface is two times 10 to the 13 in SI units. And these are the, the SI units here. So now I want you to try and estimate, okay, total number of photons that leave this surface here in one second in this very, very small solid angle five times 10 to the minus 22, inside of a valent band equal to 0 0.01 Armstrong, which is 10 to the minus 12 meters, All right? The SI units for the specific index here, per meter for the wave. Per, oh, these, per are, these are per meter, yeah. yeah. These are per meter. I hope so. I will share the Python code later and then we can check. Yeah. This was a very good question. Yeah, so Momo basically asked what are the SI units? These are not the SI units. It should be meter here, okay? So what you need to basically do is you need to make use of this equation, okay? Ignore this cosine theta here. This cosine theta takes care of the projection of, the, of this surface with respect to the beam. So just assume that cosine theta is, is one. So basically you need to use this equation here to somehow infer the number of photons. Oh, wow, this was supposed to be here. Okay. So intensity is two times 10 to the 13. Wavelength is 630 nanometers. And uh, what else did we say? We said that the surface is 100 times 100 kilometers. And the solid angle is, is five times 10 to the minus 20. If you don't have a computer or calculator candidate, that's totally fine. Just sketch, sketch the dependence. The specific intensity, but not in these units. You have to have meter here, not the answer. We're trying to find the flux or the energy. We are trying to find the number of photons, yeah. So it should be the energy over the energy of one photon. And the wavelength band is 0 0.01 Armstrong. So 10 to the minus 12 meters. So it could be that my solution later is wrong, but then it's gonna be wrong by some orders of magnitude. So it, it doesn't really. Can you repeat the question? Yes. 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 Don't worry. <clears throat> well, the people online still see it, but it's okay. Maybe my solution. Maybe my solution is wrong. It's wrong. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm going to show you this slide for one minute more, and then we can show the the logic behind this. <clears throat> Okay, so let's look at, at what I basically did to solve this. Um, so the number of the photons is going to be the total energy, the, the, the total energy in these chunks. And I like the expression chunk, I'm going to use it again later, divided by the energy of one photon, right? The energy, the total energy has to be what? Well, it has to be the intensity times the elementary surface, times the actually surface, times the angle, times the wavelength band, times the time, okay? So the point that I'm trying to make here is that intensity, and we're gonna use intensity in many equations, is a differential quantity in a way. It's defined as some derivative, actually as, as multiple derivatives here. But we can never measure these kinds of things directly, right? What we can measure is some sort of energies or numbers or something like that. So what are we actually going to do, what, what we can actually measure in is we can measure that intensity over multiplied by some small intervals, right? And here I have chosen this example specifically. So can you, can you guess why I chose 100 kilometers times 100 kilometers? What's that roughly? It's, this is better than HMI resolution, but yeah, it's a typical size of a pixel, so, so when you look at you know, images of the sun, some typical size of one pixel would, be, would correspond to 100 times 100 kilometers at the solar surface. Of course, with biggest, we aim to get much, much better. We aim to get pixels of roughly 10 kilometers or maybe even less. Yeah. Okay, then I just chose this wavelength because there are some specifically interesting spectral lines in this wavelength that's not very important. The number two times 10 to the 13, I actually obtained from a black body law for some reasonable temperature. The most important question is, so the wavelength band should also be relatively straightforward, right? I said that we are looking to, uh, to slice our radiation in very small chunks in wavelength, right? So then we hope to have very, very narrow bands, which also means we're gonna get the less photons and I'm gonna be coming back to this. What's interesting here is why I chose this angle. What angle should we be looking at? So the intensity is emitted from the solar surface, right? Let's go back to this image. It's emitted from the solar surface and we are looking at, the, at this cone here, right? The size of the solid angle corresponds to width of the cone. What does the width of the cone depend on? Exactly, the aperture of our telescope. So bigger our telescope is, or if you want the closer our telescope is to the sun, bigger span of this cone we're gonna get, okay? So now you can imagine that this cone is gonna be very small because we are looking at the four meter telescope at Earth from the sun. So it's some ridiculously small angle. Still, when you do all the calculations, and I hope that I did the calculations well, the number of photons, in this wavelength interval from this surface in this solid angle is four times 10 to the eight. Four times 10 to the eight. It means that in one second, you're gonna detect, what is it? Almost a billion photons. That's a lot of measurement. And now there are many technical problems why this number is unrealistic, et cetera, et cetera. We can't actually, I mean, our cameras can't detect billions for, for start. So there, there are many things happening, happening in between, but remember this, and we are gonna go to this you know, reasoning further and further. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit how the telescopes work. This, this, you know, this experiment about the cone and intensity and us wanting to measure the intensity 
uh, leads us to the you know the way that the telescopes how the telescopes work. And what I want to stress here is just one logic, one one logical step that we made. We went from the intensity to measure the number of photons, but what we actually do when we do observations is we go the opposite way. We count the photons and we go back and try to calibrate them back to, to intensity. Sometimes directly, more often indirectly. But we know at least that there is some proportionality between these. That number of counts that we see here is related to the intensity of the light leaving the solar atmosphere. Okay, so it's a stupid question, but go ahead and tell me why don't we use the the, the eyes for solar observations. I think my effects are wrong. So I'm already giving you the answers here. But anyway, uh, people were using guys for observations. People were using guys for science, you know, for a good chunk of history. So, so I'm giving here some, some answers. Uh, I, I didn't want to, but yeah. So telescopes, telescopes have better resolving power or resolution. What does that mean? Or if I ask you, why do we use telescopes? What, what would you say? Don't feel like you're cheating if you use this, but feel free to try. Just, just give some support. Okay, so what does better resolving power mean? <clears throat> the series between two. Exactly, exactly. So in a way we can better discern between you know, things are less fuzzy. Next class, we are exactly going to see what fuzzy means. We're going to go back to undergrad optics. We're going to derive some equations using Fraunhofer diffraction. We're going to see what it means. And then we're going to simulate some much more complicated things than we did in, in our undergrad classes. But in principle, something that is very not obvious to people who are not astronomers is that having a big dish or big lens or big mirror allows you to see causes less blurring in the image. That's simply the consequence of the wave optics. And we're gonna see next time that simply when you have a wave front encountering an obstacle, the deformations in the wave front are, are, or let's say hole, the deformations in the wave front are the smaller, the bigger the hole is. And that's also very counterintuitive. I teach optics with the undergrads and when I told them if you have the smaller hole, you're gonna get the bigger smudge. They they wouldn't believe. So, so you know about the diffraction, all of you. You know you know the base of diffraction. But it's very counterintuitive thing. I won't talk about it today, it's the topic of the next class, but go, Mom. Well, <clears throat> I think it's an important thing to say is that when you adopt scopes this game online, it doesn't matter if you have a 10 centimeter telescope or, or I totally agree. Or one meter telescope. Sure, but 10 centimeter telescope is better than five millimeter viewpoint no, right, of your right, eye. Right. Yeah. Especially for solar. Yeah. However, there is another thing. Uh, I have shown you before that, you know, the number of counts that we get in this example, it's actually a very realistic number of counts, 10 to the eight-ish. In practice, it's gonna be decreased by roughly a factor of 100 because of all the things happening inside of the telescope. So 10 to the six photons is not a big number. And at some point, we're going to talk about the noise, and we're going to see that uh, 10 to the 6 photons correspond to roughly the uncertainty of 10 to the 3, which means accuracy of roughly 0.1%. 0.1% is sometimes not enough for us to see what we want to see. We want better than 0.1%. And that's why we always want to collect more light. And actually, another equally important aspect of having big telescopes is collecting more light measuring things with, with greater accuracy. Okay. Then again, the eyes don't have instruments. Very often we, like, like maybe if we don't think about it, we can't always make the difference between the telescope and instrument, but telescope is something that we call collector. It collects the light and creates an image. Instruments measure that light, first do something to that light, like filter is an instrument, spectrograph is an instrument, polarimeter is an instrument. CCD camera is an instrument. These things analyze the light and record the actual intensity, right? And by analyzing, I mean, for example, dispersing, which means separating into wavelengths or changing the state of polar or modulating the state of polarization so that we could measure how polarized the light is. 
And okay, of course, there is a joke here that, but it's also true, is that, you know, telescopes have, have good pointing. So we can look exactly at one specific point in the sun or in the sky using a telescope. Also, usually when you think about a telescope, and if you were to take an undergrad book about the telescopes, most often, most often you're going to see a setup like this. I'm going to show it once again. And originally, when you think about the telescope, it, you think about it as a device which, was, which is meant to be used with the human eye. We, we don't use the kist and we don't use solar telescopes in that way. Uh, basically, there is, no, there is this secondary lens here, which we call eyepiece lens, and you know them with these amateur telescopes, like you have the collecting lens, and then somehow, somewhere usually on the side, you have this eyepiece lens, and you can look through it and see nicely planets and nebula and things like that. You can't put the eyes, eyepiece in a solar telescope, right? There is simply, not only because your eye would be completely burned, also because actually probably your whole head would be completely burned, but also because you, 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 don't, you don't need that. There is no, you, you, you need different setups. And the simplest possible setup is actually here in this image of a radio telescope where we have the collecting dish. The dish is focusing the intensity in one point and we have the receiver. So let's, let's try and think a little, let's try and remind ourselves a little bit how the, the geometrical optics looks like. And I'm sorry for these goofy sketches, but this is, uh, it's always easiest for me to, to sketch these kinds of things of my, you know, by myself than to, and to look online what exists. So lenses are, by the definition, uh, optical elements or chunks of glass or similar material uh, with the purpose, made with the purpose of changing the shape of the waveform, right? And I want you here to focus on the, on the red uh, beams or the red rays. These rays are actually made here to represent a flat, Play a flat harmonic wave coming toward the lens. And the goal of this lens is to change the shape of the front. In this case, this flat front coming from the left is going to be transformed into a converging front, and all these rays are going to intersect here in the focus. Of course, they, they continue going. They, they don't annihilate here or something. They continue going, you know, to here. But the point is that they are somehow focused here. And you know that in general, the source, this, these red rays would correspond to the source which is in infinity. Of course, the source doesn't have to be in infinity. It can be somewhere here. And here is an example of you know, how, the, how the focus works. And this is the well-known lens maker's equation that you maybe remember from the undergrad and so on and so on. But we are mostly interested in the situation where we have uh, you know, radiation coming from uh, one direction, basically as a as this thing. Now a question for you, and actually I was surprised how, how many people get this wrong. If now I have a different wave from where also the rays are parallel to each other, but coming from a different direction, is it gonna be focused in the same point or in the different point? Who says different? Who says same? Nobody says same. You're abstaining from the answer? Oh, no, sorry. Okay, no, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, it will be a different point, right? And actually, this is now a bit more complicated image here. We now have, let's say, a bundle of rays coming from one direction, focusing here. We have a different bundle of rays, the purple ones, they're gonna focus in another point. And you can convince yourself that this is true by simply, uh, by a symmetry argument. Right? Uh, forget about the, the back side of the lens. Just look at the front side of the lens. It's usually spherical, right? So if I rotate a little bit the direction where this comes from, then also the point where this is being focused has to rotate in the similar way, okay? So we usually think of a focus as one point, you know, where the light is focused, but it only is true for the light coming from one direction, right? Multiple directions uh, result in, in multiple uh, places where the light is focused. So we are talking not about focus point, but about the focal point. Okay, does it make sense? Cool. And these different directions are gonna correspond 
in our case are going to correspond to different points on the solar on the solar surface right so a big difference between the uh you know the the sun or between the extended objects also like galaxies nebula and so on and so on and point objects like for example stars is that for a star all radiation comes from one direction right this would be red would be one star the purple would be the other star so completely different things when we look at the sun red is one point in the solar atmosphere purple is another point in the solar atmosphere and there are infinitely many in between right we are imaging a finite object and then you have probably seen these examples right and they look something like this so this would be the simplest possible design for a telescope you have a collecting lens you have an object somewhere now imagine this object is very far away so from each of these points comes a flat flat uh, actually from this point comes a flat uh, wave front like this from this point a wave by wave front like this and so on and so on and then in the focal plane we get an image of course there are many approximations here strictly speaking speaking focal plane is not flat it's also like curved and so on and so on but imagining that this carrot here on the left is very small we could say it's a plane and this is how the image looks like and now if you could put and in the solar telescopes you don't put camera here but in our toy model telescope if you put the camera here and record you would record an image of this carrot all right cool so let's talk a little bit more about the sun and about uh, so so the differences between the point source object such as the stars and the and the extended object such as the sun so if you have sun if you, if you have the star right what you're going to do is your light from the star is going to be focused in a point and I'm still not considering diffraction here in finite resolution and so on we're talking about it in the next class let's say that everything is ideal so the light from the star is being focused in one point and that point occupies let's immediately start talking about detectors that point occupies one pixel in your image if i make a bigger telescope if i make the bigger the bigger lens that's not going to influence the fact that star is a point at all it's still going to be focused in a point except i'm going to collect more light because no matter how big our telescope is the stars are so far away that light always comes as a flat wave um, vapor of course this will change later when we start talking about the atmosphere and so on and so on now we are in the ideal world still we are in space let's say however and this is now a, this is now a point that 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 i want to say the size of this image of the carrot is going to be proportional to the focal length of the of the lens right which means bigger focal length bigger image which means that it's spread over more pixels in a way on our camera so the brightness which means the numbers of photons per your pixel let's say does increase for finite objects such as the sun increases as with the with the square of the diameter of your lens but also falls off as the square of the focal length right because the bigger focal length makes a bigger picture and then it's spread over the larger surface and you have maybe seen this this ratio d over f is called an aperture in the photography and you have all these apertures one over 2.8 for example or you even can have like one over 0 0.9 for these extra exotic usually german and russian lenses right but for these ones that we usually buy are like one over 1.8 1 over 2.8 and so on in astronomy we call that f ratio and some telescopes can also and f ratio is typically for solar telescopes bigger than one but there are some crazy uh, night nighttime telescopes which are intended to see huge chunks of the sky which have uh, f ratio smaller than or roughly one and there is also one uh, uh, distinction that is often mentioned is the so-called slow systems and fast systems and usually when we have very big focal lengths which means our f ratio is very big we talk about the slow system 
which means which and the expression slow comes from the fact that this brightness drops off and you need to integrate more you need to observe longer to achieve desired precision okay does it make sense i'm going to show you we're, we're going to do some mind mind uh, experiments with this so you will see what, what happens and vice versa if you have so-called fast system it means that the focal length is low it means that things are you know spanning about that, that your image is smaller so more light is concentrated on the on the same surface and i hope that this image comes now this is an image that kevin just sent me a few minutes well not a few minutes a few hours before the beginning of the class so this is some famous uh, american uh, uh, news news reporter right she's here in mcmath pierce solar telescope and here we see the image of the sun produced by I think it's a, it's an effective focal length of like 70 meters or something. Well, it could be 70 meters. No, it could be 70 meters. Something very big. So you see a huge image of the sun, and usually we say that you know there is a lot of power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but here the image of the sun is so big that even the energy that is focused through a big telescope is not overwhelmingly large here. Keep in mind that with telescopes, we are collecting the power. We are, strictly speaking, collecting all the power coming from the sun. And that's like 1.4 kilowatts per square meter. Okay? So your 16 meter square telescope is going to collect what? Like uh, 20 kilowatts per, uh, in total. 20 kilowatts is a lot. And then if you focus it into a small image, you can burn stuff. Literally. Okay, so once again, this is what would happen in the eye, right? And uh, I mean, in the eye, this is what, what would happen in, in visual observations. And this is usually what you would, what, just a reminder, because you maybe already know this, what happens with, uh, you know, visual observations. So you basically have the primary lens, or as we sometimes call it, objective lens, creating an image. And then this is the focal plane, and then you put another, you put another lens on the other side, and then that that other lens is set up in a such way that it still produces the parallel rays. Because the rays that entered parallel here are also exiting parallel to each other here, and then they enter your eye, which is basically third lens. And then to your eye, it looks exactly the same as it, it would look without these you know, without this lens system, except the angular size of the object is inflated. Okay, the, the, it's basically zooming. This kind of system would make things look zoomed to you. This is the, this is the goal of these things. We don't do this with, with the solar telescopes. We have usually much more complicated systems, which in the end, they have a, have a camera that is recording everything. Right? So in real telescopes, these you know, objectives or primary lens, they're not primary lenses, I call them, actually Kevin told me to call them primary telescope focusing elements, which means that the, usually we call it the primary, and it's usually a mirror. And for peakiest, when, when, when we say it's a four meter telescope, it means that the primary mirror is four meters wide. Most of the, and almost all night-based telescopes that you know what is very famous ones like Keck, Gemini, VLT and so on have mirrors, and these are usually segmented mirrors because it's very hard to make a 10 meter mirror. There are some telescopes, however, that have uh, that still use lenses, and one of them is the example of this amazing telescope that I talked about in the last class, which is called Swedish Solar Telescope, right? Okay. And uh, we never observe in the primary focus. Primary focus is the focal plane of this primary focusing on, right? We actually, the light is focused there, but then there, there are many other elements following and we are measuring after a few other mirrors and it's not really trivial for us now in class to sketch and understand how everything looks like, but you could still define something called effective focal length, which would correspond to the you know, focal length of, of your full system and which would basically allow you to calculate how your image is gonna look like when it passes through this, through this optical system. 
And we sort of need to know that because it tells us what we can see. And it also, the different, the telescopes with different uh, goals and different concepts and different scientific, you know, requirements have, have different effective focal lengths. For example, SDO has relatively low focal, relatively small focal length because it's intended to look at the whole sun. And we're going to do another small calcul calculation exercise in the next slide, which deals with SDO. However, DKIST will have significantly higher effective focal length because it's aimed at looking at the small stuff, the things happening at the small scales. And then your scientific idea will maybe require one telescope or the other one, depending whether you want to have a broad idea of huge chunks of the sun or very detailed idea about very small chunks of the sun. Okay, so let's do, oh man, why is this not working? Okay, so let's do the following exercise. Okay, I'm sorry about this. This was supposed to go like, you know, sequentially, but I maybe transferring between the two computers, it didn't work out. So let's estimate, and here you have solutions so you can check yourself. What would be the size of the solar disk seen by the telescope, which has effective focal length of five meters? So the angular size of the sun is roughly half a, um, half a degree, more precisely 32 arc minutes. So try and transform, tr try and relate that size and the effective focal length of five minutes, uh, of five meters, sorry, to a physical size of the image of the, of the sun. So there is the solution here. It's 4.65 centimeters, but why? Well, the size of the image is basically just going to be the angular size of the object times the focal length, right? It's, it's this argument that I made that I made here, right? This angle theta here is equal to this angle theta here, right? And the distance between these two points is going to be theta times the focal length. When I create the image, the size of the image of the carrot is going to be the angular size of the carrot, of the real carrot, times the focal length. For the sun, it's going to be 32 arc minutes times 5 meters. And it's roughly, so since the, since the physical size of the image is directly proportional to the focal length, roughly each meter of the focal length gives you one centimeter of size. Okay, so if I had 100 meter focal length, I would have one centimeter large image. Okay, so now assuming that we have a CCD which has a 10 micrometers big pixels, how many pixels do we need to fit the whole sun? Well, you just divide 4.65 centimeters with 10 micrometers, micrometers, and you're going to get 4,6500, which is basically. 4K times 4K pixels. And surprise, surprise, the instrument that I devised this exercise on, SDO, actually has cameras which are roughly 4K times 4K. Okay? Does it make sense? So now for you, the question uh, Can you roughly estimate what's the what is the angular coverage, so to speak, of one of these pixels? How big angle in the sky does one pixel cover? Yeah, so basically you need to divide 10 micrometers by the focus to get the angular size of one pixel. You need to divide the size of one pixel with the focal length, and then you will see how big angle the, because the angle of the image, of the chunk of the image seen from the lens is the same as the angle, the actual object is seen from the lens, right? These two angles are the same. Or you could just say like this, I have uh, 32 minutes, which is like two, what would it be? 32 minutes is 2000 arc seconds, right? I have 2,000 arc seconds on roughly 4K pixels, which means that one pixel is roughly one half of a second. And actually, that's, that's true. The pixels on SDO are roughly half of a second. 
Okay, cool. So obviously the dickiest, we're gonna have much higher focal length because we want to see much, much smaller things. And here is an example of an instrument. So it's, it's not a bad idea for us to take a look how the actual instrument, the dickiest are gonna look like. This is so-called VBI, Visible Broadband Imager. Visible means it looks, it doesn't mean that the instrument is visible. I mean, it's obviously visible. It means that the radiate, that it looks at visible wavelengths and it might look obvious, but actually DKIS will be able to look at infrared wavelengths too. We will be able to see up to 28 microns or something like that. Some, some relatively large number. Of course, we cannot look at the UV light because UV light is not transmitted by the atmosphere. So not even up there on a the mountain, that there is enough UV light to transmit. Right. Broadband. Why do we call it broadband? We call it broadband because it's focusing on it's 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 integrating this specific intensity that we talked before a lot uh, over relatively large uh, wavelength intervals. Right. So here you have specifications for various filters and you have width for for every filter and now if we had some you know nighttime astronomers here they would be a bit flabbergasted how we can say that you know 0 0.1 nanometers is a broad filter but for us it's a broad filter because i told you that very often we're going to look at small fractions of this with fabry barrel and with factor and here you have the the central the central wavelengths of these things. And the imager means that this instrument is aimed basically at making images. So we're gonna have one image at this wavelength, one at this, one at this, one at this, and so on. We can arbitrarily tune and change our wavelengths to really get detailed spatial coverage. So that means that probably this instrument will be able to make fantastic images of the sun, but we won't be able to do really super detailed science with that because we, we will be lacking this detailed wavelength coverage. So we will always use this either to track very fast events happening in the, in the atmosphere of the sun or to provide a complementary context to the, to the other instruments, okay? Also, this, this uh, instrument is gonna have a relatively big field of view. And now I have, I have stated the difference between something called optical field of view and the physical field of view. Does anybody have the idea of what the difference is between these two things? I mean, different instruments on DMS will have different fields of view. Optical or physical? Physical ones, yeah. <laughs> I think optical refers to the optical train of the telescope that provides two minutes of the same quality. Yeah. In physical, it's just going to be how big is your CCD on the instrument. But if you can build big enough instruments to be able to operate in two minutes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you guys were right. The, the optical field of view refers to which chunk of the sun basically, uh, from, from how big chunk of the sun we allow the light to pass through our instrument, through our optical system of the telescope to the instruments, which means cameras, filters, and so on and so on. And in this case, it's roughly two arc minutes. Two arc minutes is not a small amount. The whole sun is 32 arc minutes. So we are cutting here one sixteenth of the sun. However, so, so basically, if we go back to the, to the simplest possible setup of the telescope, which is, Okay, this one is not really good, but okay, we could say this one. The, the field of view would basically just, for, for this kind of telescope, which is just one lens, the field of view would be the size of the lens, the diameter of the lens, divided by the focal, by the focus. That's basically the, the angle in the sky that, we, that can fall into our, into our system and eventually end up in the focus. Obviously, when we have more than one mirror and lens, situation is more complicated. So this is what these two arc minutes correspond to. They correspond to the visible part of the sun. Also, with such a huge telescopes, we can't get much more because we don't want to let a lot of power enter our telescopes because all that heat and energy doesn't, doesn't only risk our instrument, but it also heats up the uh, things in the telescope and creates some additional noise and so on and so on. 
physical field of view refers refers to the fact how big chunk of this optical field of view I can cover with my detector. So the cameras that we have, they have finite size. So apparently, I don't know how big are the cameras for, for VDI, but they're gonna have also 4K times 4K pixels. So they will be able, able to cover for the case of the blue, blue wavelengths, roughly 45 arc seconds, for the red wavelengths, 69, 69 arc seconds. And uh, in principle, if we had bigger cameras, we could increase this, or if we stacked more cameras next to each other. Does anybody here know about a telescope called uh, LSST? Yeah. LSST is a large Sloan Sky Survey. No, LS, telescope, large. Large synoptics, oh, okay. So it's a big telescope which is made, which is intended uh, to, which is gonna start working relatively soon. And now it's been renamed to Vera Rubin Telescope actually, which is a very nice thing to, to acknowledge her. Uh, that telescope is gonna have huge field of view. So they are gonna stack many cameras next to each other. So effectively it's gonna be, I don't know, tens of thousands of pixels and tens of thousands of pixels. Something really, really ridiculous. I can look it up and let you know. But we are really, really short of time so so we're going to go through we're going to hurry up a little bit so what i wanted to focus on here is that you know we are going from the original what we had at the sun is some specific intensity leaving the solar surface right then we're going to integrate that intensity over some wavelength interval depending on our instrument over some time interval depending on our time you know resolution so to speak or sampling and over some angle, which basically depends on the size of our telescope, right? And all these quantities are gonna be very small. So basically what we can say is we can say, okay, we have this specific intensity, we just multiply it by the wavelength band, by the angular band, and so on and so on. Sometimes for the valence, it's gonna be a little bit more tricky, right? And then if I take this quantity, which is basically energy, I divide it by the, num by the energy of one photon, I'm gonna get the number of photons, these photons travel to my instruments, some of them are lost, right? Eventually they end up on a detector, which is CCD or SMOS camera, and that SMOS camera counts them. So what we get in the end are some sort of counts on our camera, and that's what we actually measure, and then we transport them back to the intensity. Okay, cool. So then when you're looking at something at the sun, what will your signal depend on? where well, it's gonna depend on the size of the region that you have, right? Basically, it's gonna depend on the size of the pixel that you have in your image. If you have really small pixels, if one of the pixels on your image corresponds to very small area in the sun, we're gonna get less photons, right? Then if we are integrating, if our filters or other instruments have very small wavelength chunks, we're gonna get less photons. If we are integrating over larger wavelength intervals, we're gonna get more photons. Then also integration time, right? If I let my camera record for longer, I'm gonna get more photos and vice versa. And you all know that when you, when you use it, for example, when you use a DSLR camera in, in aperture mode, then it sets the, the exposure automatically. And when you look at something dark and click, it sets a long exposure and you get rubbish. That's because the camera wants to give you enough photons to make a good picture. But of course, your camera is not stable. Uh, and finally, the solid angle. This is a little bit counterintuitive, but basically the solid angle is determined by the size of your telescope. And the bigger telescope you get, the bigger cone of your emergent intensity you're gonna take. And these first three quantities are determined by your science, in a way, okay? So how, at how small, you know, at how small regions I want to look, how finely I want to divide my wavelength, which basically means how nicely I want to resolve spectral lines, how fast I want to integrate to capture some time evolution, right? And these, we, we can't really control them. I mean, we control them, but we control them according to our science goal. So the only thing, once we fix the first three, the only thing that we can adjust and we can work toward to increase the, the, the accuracy is basically the size of our task. So if we are talking about the fixed temporal, spectral, and spatial resolution, and you want to improve it, the only thing, there are only two things you can do. 
One is to make bigger telescope, two is to make better telescope and better instruments, better in sense that they base less photons. That there is less photons randomly being lost through the, through the system. And actually that's something we call efficiency. And I don't know about predicted efficiency of thickest, but for many other ground-based solar telescopes, the efficiency is roughly 1% to 10%. So most of the photons are being lost. And actually one of the well-known solar observers, Manolo Collados, one, in one of the talks, actually convinced us and gave us a really good example that if you want to look at the sun with, with very big spatial, temporal, and spectral resolution, it's less bright than the stars. Okay, so here are some quantities. I'm not gonna go through them because we're running, uh, we're running out of time and these are also not very related to the solar observation. So these are just some things that you stellar people can, can you know, take to try to relate the, the specific intensity to. Uh, and here there is another small exercise uh, that's trying to convince you that we are basically looking at uh, uh, that what we are really measuring really is the intensity. So here we see a, a disk of the sun, right? The whole disk of the sun imaged somewhere. And you can see maybe that the, hey Ryan, hey, you can see that the edges of the, of the sun are darker than the center. Okay. And now I have a question for you. When we looked over the edges, right? The, the surface of the sun is curving, right? Okay, so it means that bigger surface of the sun fits in one pixel because of the projection, right? Here at the center, I see this surface, okay? But at the edges, because the sun is curved, I'm gonna see much bigger surface is gonna fall in, the, in this thing. So how can it be then that the, then the edges are dark? They should be brighter because more surface is falling there, right? Depends on the angle, exactly. Yeah, so if you remember, here is another nice, nice sketch from me. In the definition of the intensity, we have the surface times the angle. And this is why this angle, which sometimes can be a bit confusing, actually comes. It comes to basically, you know, turn around your, your surface and make it always perpendicular to the direction you're looking at. And actually, this, there is, this is related to a physical phenomenon. So when we look at the center of the sun, we see the light coming straight out with perpendicularly to the, to the normal. At the edges, we, sorry, uh, parallel to the normal. At the edges, we're looking at the light coming out basically perpendicularly to the normal. We're looking at the intensity in two different directions. And actually, the emergent distribution intensity, the, the emergent distribution of the intensity is not isotropic. There is more light coming out perpendicular to the surface than parallel to the surface. And this is something that we call limb darkening, as I said. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish with this. We won't have time to look at the data. We're gonna look at the data on Tuesday. Those of you who are interested in it can, of course, look there in the meantime. I just want to <coughs> say basically to mention what sampling is because we sort of started talking about it in the, previous, in the previous slide and to stress differences between the sampling and the resolution. We're gonna talk about the resolution much more next week, but basically I tried to tell you that uh, um, the amount of photons that we get from the sun depends on how small chunks of the surface we look at, over how small chunks of the time we integrate over, and how small, over how small chunks of the wavelength we integrate over, right? So, uh, sometimes we want these things to be big because we want to get more photons, but mostly we want them to be as small as possible, right? Because it's somehow intuitively clear that in more, in, in, if, you, if I divide my image in, in a lot of small chunks, I'm gonna see things more resolved, right? There is this very, you know, there was this craze at some point, I, I doubt that it still exists because we sort of saturated, but there was this craze about having a mobile phone with cameras having a lot of megapixels. As if it was, you know, ensuring the quality of the image somehow, it doesn't. 
because the quality of the image is actually, you know, defined by the <coughs> quality of the lens in your atmospheric conditions. But this refers to sampling. This basically refers, and <coughs> sampling is, strictly speaking, how often, and by how often I mean in all of the coordinates, not only in time, also in space, in the wavelength, I'm taking the samples of the data. And of course, higher my sampling is, less photons I'm gonna get, and more finely I'm gonna divide something, but that doesn't necessarily reflect higher resolution. We're gonna talk about resolution further, but let's just say the following thing. If your eyes, or, or, or actually let's use the mobile phone. If your mobile phone lens cannot resolve something, like for example, two lamps kilometers away, it doesn't matter how many pixels you have on your chip, okay? You're gonna see these things as blurred. You're only gonna use more little chunks of, of the chip to cover these blurs. Nothing has changed. So sampling and the resolution are different things. If I gave you now data and told you each pixel of this data is, I don't know, 0 0.05 arc seconds in the sky, that would be sampling. The actual resolution would depend in general case, on the size of your telescope, mm -hmm. on the conditions in the atmosphere, on the post-processing techniques that you use, et cetera, et cetera. And then it would actually be relatively hard to define. Okay, questions, comments? Concerns? People online, everything okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so basically what we wanted to focus on today is I wanted to introduce a specific monochromatic intensity as uh, a quantity of choice for modeling, but also for observations. And then we try to relate it to what we measure in our instruments. And then we played with this toy model of the telescope to basically try and see how these things are related and what happens inside. Of course, the full story is much more complicated. And at some point, somebody's probably when we play with the so-called instrument performance calculator, we're gonna, we're gonna also have the person who, who demonstrated to us, we're gonna have them show us the optical design of TKS. It's gonna be complicated for us and we won't be able to fully appreciate it, but at least we'll see roughly where the light goes <coughs> and, and how the things are, are happening. Cool, so we will start the, the next, uh, uh, the next uh, you can try to do this at home, to play with this uh, FITS file that I have linked to you on the web page. But we're going to go through this very quickly at the beginning of the next class. And then in the next class, we're going to talk about diffraction. We are going to basically do a small refresher of what, uh, what happens with the diffraction on the, on the slit. Because it's important later to understand better the diffraction gratings. But we're going to jump very quickly to diffraction of spherical aperture. And we're going to play a bit with Fourier transforms and things like that. And we're basically going to see how the diffraction influences our image and what happens there. And that will be important because then the week after next week, we have two hands-ons dealing with image restoration. And that's gonna be basically the state of the art. So you're gonna do the things that people are gonna do to the DKIS data once it comes. Okay, cool. See you all on Tuesday.